What what the heck is going? What are they doing, Joe? Well, I, you know, that's what a lot of. I mean, I hate to take their side, but I think they're making a mistake. That's what Republicans are, and don't worry, nobody will ever think you're taking their side. <laughs> uh, but that's what a lot of Republicans are asking right now. It just doesn't make any sense. I'm glad we showed the clip of the the, the morning after the election, because remember, hey, how you doing? this was the biggest landslide in the history of mm. off-year elections. Republicans did worse, got beaten by more votes than any party ever. And the 40 House seats that were flipped, that was the Republican Party's worst performance since Watergate. There were three issues that mattered. Russia, oh wait, no, it wasn't Russia. Nope. It was health care, health care, and health care. And as we said yesterday, Mika, Donald Trump's record on this is so abhorrent, is so sure to turn off voters in Wisconsin and Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania and Florida, the states that matter the most. He promised universal health care. And then he lied. Two years later, he said, no way. He didn't want it. It was too expensive and too inefficient. He promised he wouldn't cut Medicare for seniors, wouldn't take money away from them. He ended up cutting $845 billion in his latest budget. Now, they'll quibble and say it wasn't $845 billion. It was more like $560 billion. It was a lot of money. Donald Trump also promised he'd never cut Medicaid. And you remember he bragged about it. He said, this, this is my deal, mm -hmm. me promising to never cut Medicare and Medicaid, and Mike Huckabee's actually stealing these ideas from me. He was so proud of that fact. Well, he broke those promises as well. He promised Americans. He promised workers in Wisconsin. He promised workers in Michigan. He promised workers in Pennsylvania. You're going to pay less. Your deductibles are going to be less. You're going to get better coverage. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to have coverage and I'm not going to eliminate pre-existing conditions. What he proposed yesterday, make no mistake, in 2020, a much bigger political earthquake on the ground than anything we find out when the Mueller report is finally released. And we actually know what's in the Mueller report instead of a hand-picked, sort of a scrubbed, sanitized letter that William Barr picked, a man again who got his job because he wrote a job application that said, I don't like Robert Mueller's report. I mean, whatever he said, it was like, he was like a third grader asking if he could get a paper out, and that's how Barr got his job. He wrote a letter, that letter. Nobody will remember in 2020. They will remember the Mueller report when we finally find out what the Mueller report is, and they're going to remember this because health care will be the issue that determines who wins Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Florida, and the White House. So the Justice Department says it's going to take weeks, uh, not months, for the Attorney General to make a version of the special counsel's report public, and that's going to be the issue there, too. Uh, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Lindsey Graham, says William Barr told him the delay is so that classified information, grand jury testimony, and other sensitive material can be removed. Graham says he spoke to President Trump last night and that the president did not object to the Mueller report being made public. Attorney General Barr, the senator says, will appear before the Judiciary Committee sometime next month. Meanwhile, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi suggested Attorney General William Barr's summary was written to protect the president. Right now, the message should be clearly, let us see this report. We don't need an interpretation by Attorney General, who is appointed for a particular job, to make sure the president is above the law. So foreign, foreign policy analyst David Rothkopf uh, tweeted this yesterday. Trump publicly welcomed the support of an enemy, one with whom he had hidden financial ties. That enemy worked to help get him elected, and he rewarded them with the defense of their attacks on our democracy and with policy benefits no U.S. president had offered before. So, Richard Haas, let's keep that up for one second, because I actually, I challenged the, everybody that followed me. I just I had a quick question. Which one of these are not true? Trump publicly welcomed the support of an enemy. He certainly did in that press conference. One with whom he had hidden financial ties. Of course, he lied throughout the entire campaign, but in fact, he was hoping to get the tower in Moscow through most of the campaign. 
That enemy worked to help get him elected. We know that. Every, every intel agency in Washington, D.C. says that's true. And he rewarded them with a defense of their attacks on our democracy, which he did. He said, Vladimir Putin, ex-KGB agent, I believe you. I don't believe my intel chiefs. And with policy benefits no U.S. president had offered before. And of course, Richard, there, where do we begin? He's busting up NATO, uh, or at least he certainly has, has been more negative towards NATO than, than Vladimir Putin could ever suspect. And he opened the door back to the Russians staying in Syria and the Middle East. So which one of those, uh, David Rothkopf said, which one of those statements is not true? I mean, fair enough. I, I just say on the other side of it, Joe, that it still doesn't prove collusion. So I think one just has to put that aside. No. And then secondly, right. it's also true that this administration did some things vis-a-vis -vis Russia that I think were right. It did provide uh, arms to Ukraine, something the previous administration <laughs> wouldn't do. And it has put into place some fairly robust sanctions against against Russia and individuals in Russia. I'm not going to argue, though, the, the basic point. And I think the most serious thing is what this administration has done to weaken the fabric of the Atlantic Alliance, whether it's by calling the EU a foe, whether it's by introducing real questions of unpredictability and unreliability into, into NATO. And I think that is truly, truly corrosive on a, on a historical scale. Mike Barnacle, let's put up the list again for you, and, and, and you, t you, you take a, a, a shot at it. Again, the question is very simple. Which one of these are not true? Trump publicly welcomed the support of an enemy, one with whom he had hidden financial ties. That enemy worked to help get him elected, and he rewarded them with the defense of their attacks on our democracy and with policy benefits no U.S. president had offered before, from Syria to NATO especially. What's, what's not true in that statement? Joe, it's all true. It's all true. But I was told by a, a very wise person yesterday afternoon that when you look at all of the uh, charges surrounding the conspiracy charges that uh, have been leveled against the president, it's not illegal to encourage someone or some entity to do something. If right. the Russians wanted to do something, they were encouraged to do it. But that's not illegal. Right. I mean, Richard is absolutely right on the mark when, when you talk about this presidency, it's what he's done to diminish and or maybe destroy existing institutions that have stood for 70, 75 years and, and created a, a, at least a, a welcome mat in Europe and, and, a, and, a, yeah. and a system for peace in existing conditions there now. Yeah, and again, I, 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 we understand Robert Mueller has said there was no collusion with the Russian government, whatever that means, because, of course, you had William Barr tighten it up as much as he could to talk about the Russian government. We don't know what's going to end up being in the Mueller report. But, Mika, I have a question for you. Mm. Uh, and if you could put the David Rothkoff uh, uh, tweet up again. And again, I'm not, this is, this is not about, I'm just a poor country lawyer. I, oh, here I, we go. So I'm not talking the legal side of this. I'm saying, be that as it may, even if we end up reading the report and finding out that this wasn't even a close call on conspiracy, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, Mika, what voters in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Ohio and Florida are going to want a president who publicly welcomed the support of an enemy, one with whom he had hidden financial ties, and then that enemy worked to help him get elected during the 2006 cam team campaign. And then Donald Trump rewarded our enemy with the defense of their attacks on our democracy by saying that he trusted an ex-KGB agent more than he trusted the FBI director or his home uh, homeland security uh, secretary. And then he rewarded them with policy benefits no American president had ever offered before. Now, I'm not, I'm not going over here, Mika, mm -hmm. uh, old news. This is not about the Mueller report. This is just about what we know to be true. And when people are running around the TV saying, he was vindicated, there was nothing there. Forget yeah. the fact that Donald Trump and everybody around him lied about their, their uh, support of Russia, uh, their connections with Russia. I'm just saying we're taking it from the legal now just straight to the political. I mean, how many people in swing states are going to look at those facts, which are not in dispute, and go, oh, yes, that's who I want as my commander-in-chief, somebody that 
that, you know, uh, provides aid and comfort to the enemy politically. So I, I can add to that. I mean, you can see it'll be fascinating to see what the report shows if we're allowed to see it all. My concern is that national security concerns could be stretched to cover up a lot of what's in this report. I hope all of it is seen for everybody. Um, but all along the way, while all of this was happening, and while you can read along to everything that David Rothkopf tweeted about and see it happening in real time right in front of our eyes, Donald Trump had his close allies, people who worked with him every step of the way in the campaign, who came with him to the White House, Michael Flynn and Paul Manafort being at the very top of that, his national security advisor, a guy who flew around with him everywhere and apparently was his like emotional teddy bear to talk to him in between events to keep him busy. And Paul Manafort, the guy who headed his campaign in jail, going to jail, jail. in jail. And guess Austin. what? Look at the president. Not one line of defense for these guys throws them under the bus, close friends, family friends, people he lived and traveled with, stayed at Mar-a-Lago with, throws people under the bus as if they are garbage, could give a damn about them. Is that someone you want in the White House? Somebody with no empathy? Somebody with no sense of, of duty or loyalty? Somebody who doesn't take a loyalty oath back as a human being? Who does he hire, by the way? Criminals? That's what people have to think about when they're well, I, wondering whether or not to reelect this president. It's awfully harsh to say, ask if he hires criminals. And I mean, Jonathan because, Lemire. No, no, but hold on a second, Mika, though. Yeah. I mean, you can't just put that charge out there because you can't just say hires criminals. Can't? I, mean, I understand really? his national security advisor is a convicted felon. I understand right. that, but you can't say. I understand his campaign manager. Right. The guy that he said he needed to win the Republican nomination is going to jail probably for the rest of his life. But does that mean? He hires criminals. I understand. The guy he told the Washington well, Post is criminals. most important. Uh, come on, come on. You gotta, you, you, you gotta let me be sarcastic here. Let me finish. Go this. ahead. That, the guy, anyway, no, you've ruined it. You've ruined the setting. You've ruined the mood. He right. hires criminals. Everybody around him either is a criminal, or they're lying. I mean, they've all lied about And these Russia, are his closest the friends. President, Look at the president, vice president. I mean, just down the list. Jonathan Cohen. Lemire, though. Um, you know. I've read, because I read everything you write. In fact, Meek and I, like, that's what we do for entertainment on the weekend. Don't we talk just, about a private life. We, but I have to. This part is the most exciting part of our private life. It's where we print out on, on, our, our, on our copier thing, thingamabobber, our copy machine. Um, we mimeograph, actually. <laughs> and and uh, just tr it's just coming out in triplicate, by the way. We, we read, and, and we read your AP reports. Thank oh, you. God, Thank they're amazing. Guys. They are amazing. No, they're amazing. <laughs> I'm not going to, I don't even get into it. But anyway, as we're reading this in triplicate, Mika always gives me like the carbon, baby. Mm -hmm. It gets dirty and then that. I have to wash my the hands all copy. weekend. You, get the you know, copy? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you just don't want to hear about any of this. But anyway, uh, neither do the, the viewers. Thank you for staying with me, viewers. Uh, but anyway, because this has got to go somewhere. I understand by reading all of your Associated Press stories that Donald Trump has been planning for some time, and your reporting was dead accurate. Uh, he's planning to use this as a political plus going into 2020. The only downside of that is that when he brings it up, then you bring up, not you, but anybody running against him is going to be able to bring up all of these stubborn facts that Donald Trump encouraged the enemy to get involved in his campaign. The enemy responded that night by starting to try to hack the Democrats. Donald Trump and his son were thrilled that the Russians were going to help with their campaign and give them dirt. Donald Trump and his entire family got together and, and his staff got together and concocted a lie on Air Force One about the, what the Russian meetings were about. Literally, there is a litany that would last five minutes that may not make him uh, legally guilty, just like Hillary wasn't indicted, but certainly would indict him politically. So I just wonder, do they really want to take this into 2020? Are they really going to be campaigning on Mueller in Russia so Democrats can remind everybody what a liar he and his staff are and how many felons are actually spending time in jail because of Russia? Well, a few things. First, thank you to Joe and Mika for being such loyal readers. Uh, second, yeah, you we, mentioned, we, we love this stuff. You mentioned the, the problem, perhaps, of stubborn facts, and I would put
put the question back to you. When have stubborn facts ever stopped this president uh, when it comes to his campaign rhetoric and what he chooses to talk about each and every day? So yes, you are right. This is something that in recent weeks, as there was seemingly growing momentum, that the Mueller report was going to come back without new indictments. And again, of course, as you point out, we don't know what's fully in there yet. It may be a few weeks before we do. And even then, it might just be a version of what's in the report. But at the very least, as momentum grew, that it, there wasn't going to be that smoking gun, that last wave of, of people being charged. The president and people around him realized they could turn the tables on the Mueller report, at least they would attempt to, that they would use it as, to point out, look, you had a two-year, almost, investigation, yet, yes, I criticized it at every turn, but I didn't fire Mueller, I didn't interfere, Mueller himself said so, there was nothing that he asked for he couldn't get, and that he, you didn't bring me down, is the short version of this. And that he was then going to go ahead and say, look, you had your chance. House Democrats, you want to still come at me with these investigations? Well, look, I gave you the opportunity, and if you're going to continue with this, that just shows it's partisan overreach. And we can dispute that, the, the, with the facts of that, but the politics of it is that's going to be their play. Now, an argument can be made, of course, that the White House should turn the page on this. You move on to the next thing, because it does bring up uncomfortable questions. But the president, time and time again, instead of suggesting that he would try to turn the page, move on to bipartisanship, or anything like that, the vibe from the White House in the last 48 hours has been they plan to use this, they're going to be vindictive and use it as retribution against their opponents, against the media, mm -hmm. against Democrats. And I'm going to be at his rally tomorrow night in Michigan, which will be his first since this Mueller report findings. And I think it's safe to say he'll bring it up more than once and not in an effort to say, let's turn the page, but rather to bludgeon his political foes. <clears throat> Joe, let me, ask, let me ask you and Meeker a question. What are the odds, do you think, that Russia, the whole thing that we've gone through that we're still talking about today, obviously the redactions that are, that are coming in the report, will not be a factor in October in 2020 in Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, New York City, largely because it's potentially, given the drift and the incompetence of this administration, there will be over 100 million Americans without health care, mm -hmm. unable to see a doctor, or perhaps paying right. through the nose and higher <clears throat> premiums for their existing health plans because the insurance companies will be able to run amok. Well, 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 Mike, I mean, that's exactly why we showed the clip coming off the top. Not only will it not be an issue in 2020, it wasn't an issue in 2018 when a lot of Americans thought that Donald Trump was guilty and was going to be going to jail. People have never cared about the Russian investigation. We have said it here on TV before. Democratic candidates have come up and said they aren't talking about Russia. Now, they were talking about caravans in middle America when Donald Trump was making up stories about a crisis at the border. But they don't. They just don't care about it. They're not going to care in 2020. We're going to be talking about health care in one minute. Yeah. We're going to be showing you polls in some swing states that show that Donald Trump is underwater, has a lot of work to do. But, Mika, I would just say, uh, John Lomir mm -hmm. asked a good question. Mm -hmm. When will facts finally matter to Donald Trump? Can I, have a, can I answer that? Yeah. When the Democrats finally have a candidate, how to get in his face, let's talk March Madness, with a full court press and just smother him with the facts wherever he goes. Oh, it was a witch hunt, really? Would you please pick up the phone and call your campaign? Oh, you can't. He's in jail. Well, why don't you ask your first national security advisor for his witch? Oh, wait, you can't do that either. He's a convicted felon, too. Turn state evidence against you. Well, why don't you, your, your, your foreign policy, oh, wait, no, he's in jail also. You can talk to your long-term political advisor, who's been your longest political advisor ever, Roger Stump. Oh, wait a second. No? Mm -hmm. Well, then maybe your fixer. Maybe you can call my, no, no. The, the facts are so bad Yeah. that this is just sort of a swatting away, swat that rhetoric right away, and go right to health care land the political punch and then move straight in to where it, it counts the most in the gut of American politics. And that is health care, the promises that he made and the promises that he broke. And not over Russia, not over Robert Mueller, not over his handpicked uh, uh, attorney general, but over health care. He promised universal health care. He took it away. He promised no cuts to Medicare. Then he slashed and burned Medicare. He promised no cuts to Medicaid. Then he slashed and burned Medicaid. He promised people they were going to get lower premiums. They were going to have lower deductibles. They were going to have better coverage. 
that he wasn't going to take away pre-existing conditions? Lie, 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 lie. Good luck with that in the upper Midwest, Mr. President. So we'll talk to Heidi and Michael Steele um, about the battle over health care coming up and also the Trump campaign job description, which would be uh, defending that broken promise. Also, if you want to work for the Trump campaign, you got to sign that loyalty oath and must be willing to go to jail. Yeah, we'll add I that mean, on that as know, well. It's just it's part of the, the deal. It's part of the deal. Um, he'll throw you away like a piece of trash. And that's exactly what you want to do when you give to a part candidate. Of the deal. So Put coming up, resume. President Trump is renewing his fight to end Obamacare, even though the issue hurt Republicans in 2018. We'll get Michael and Heidi and they're reporting on that story. Plus this. And he did this all in the name of self-promotion. And he used the laws of the hate crime legislation that all of us collectively over years have put on the books to stand up to be the values that embody what we believe in. This is a whitewash of justice. What, what, the, the, what the hell was that about, Mika? Uh, I think the mayor Is of Jesse, Chicago just said it. Jesse Smollett? Stuff? There's, what was that I'm about? I'm going to just stick to the facts, but your gut, when you listen to this story, will tell you something else. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube, and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.